Change of Command Ceremony is a time-honored tradition, officially marking the continuity of command. It is a formal ritual conducted before the assembled company of the command, as well as honored guests and dignitaries. The Change of Command Ceremony is unique in the world today. It is a formal transfer of the total authority, responsibility, and accountability of command from one individual to another. Due to COVID-19, this ceremony will be a hybrid with in-person and virtual participation. Vice Admiral Paparo is joining us remotely via live stream here in Bahrain. And the presiding officer, U.S. Central Command Commander General McKenzie has recorded remarks. The guests remain standing for the arrival of the official party, the parading of the colors, and the national anthems. Vice Admiral, United States Navy, arriving. Naval Forces Central Command, 5th Fleet, Combined Maritime Forces, arriving. Bosun, post the side boys. Aye, aye, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, the national anthem of the Kingdom of Bahrain. Gentlemen, the national anthem of the United States. Oh, say, can you? 
Chaplain John Calancis will now deliver the invitation. Let us pray. Merciful and loving Lord, hear us whenever we call upon you. Today marks the transfer of command responsibility between two of your good and faithful servants. They have not hidden their talents but have dedicated their personal skills and gifts to the service of our country. Bless them both with success in their coming endeavors. Keep their families under your protection as your servants focus on their duty to our nation. Let us all perceive the many, many benefits of your compassion. We are forever dependent upon you. For you are the one who saves, and to you are due glory, honor, and worship now and forevermore. Amen. Will the guests please be seated? Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral James J. Malloy, Commander, Naval Forces Central Command, 5th Fleet Combined Maritime Forces. Good morning. Okay. Are we on? Sir. First, I'd like to uh, give a shout out um, before I even start. Um, they asked about four or five months ago if I needed a band. I said, I don't need a band, I got IC1 Connor. Uh, the national anthem has never been more beautiful um, from my perspective. So, well done, where are you? Thank you very much. Like many things here in my tenure, this change of command is anything but routine. Both our guest speaker and my relief cannot be here in person, and as with many things, we adapt and we overcome. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I would like to welcome some special guests. I'm honored that some of you could join us, and I would like to recognize specifically the ambassadors from the UK, Japan, Pakistan, Oman, and our own Charge Affairs. Thank you for coming. Uh, for friends from Bahrain and my brothers, uh, Rear Admiral Yosef Ahmed Al Malala, uh, Major General Sheikh Hamad Al Abdullah Al Khalifa, Rear Admiral Mohammed Al Asada, Rear Admiral Mohammed Al Assam, the head of the Navy, and Rear Admiral Al Asaidi, the head of the Coast Guard. My CMF commanders who are here, uh, Commander Rear Admiral Al Faki, uh, from 
Saudi Arabia, CTF 150, CTF 151, Rabo Anarish from Turkey, and 152, Commander Omar al from Jordan. Senior NATO representatives from our choice trusted coalition partners. Ms. Ikram uh, al Khatan, who is working, where is she? Here. Uh, here comes some flowers for you. Uh, and Mr. Akhil Shahabi, two of my trusted advisors and dearest friends here in Bahrain. And then on stage with me, NASCENT Deputy Commander Kurt Renshaw, CMF Deputy Royal Navy Com Commodore Dean Bassett, CTF 515 Commodore Commander Brigadier General Farrell Sullivan, United States Marine Corps, and Task Force Sentinel Commander Royal Navy Commodore Robert Bel Belfield. And I'd be remiss if I did not mention our own NASCENT Vice Commander Roddy DeWalt, who could not be with us here today. Task Force Commanders and CEOs from the Waterfront, welcome. I'd like to also call out my three command master chiefs, Master Chiefs Call, Ochoa, and Poland, who day to day conquered the amazing task of leading and mentoring all of our sailors and all of us service members here while simultaneously advising the command senior leaders. I have been deeply appreciated your wisdom and your leadership. Captains Greg Smith and Scott Avery, our superb base CEOs, thank you for ensuring our sailors, Marines, Coast Guardmen, and service members have the best leadership in the Navy especially here in Bahrain. I'd like to give a shout out to our four superb ombudsmen, Jaina Jenkin Vernon, Selena Parker, Jessica Pines, and Carmen Sunderman. I thank you for caring so deeply and working so diligently for the Navy's most precious commodity, our sailors and their families. Mrs. Paparo online and children, welcome, along with the broader Paparo plan, probably up at three o'clock in the morning with my wife, complaining about us on the East Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, I know that's a long list. The length of that list of 100 guests speaks to the importance, though, and the strength of the command and the relationships that exist between our services, the coalition, and our host Navy Bahrain, host nation Bahrain. We're honored to have with us virtually today's guest speaker. He is an officer I'm proud to call a mentor and a friend, U.S. Central Command Commander General Kent McKenzie. General McKenzie is a leader and a warrior whose skill on the battlefield as an infantry officer is matched only by his ability as a strategist to think three steps ahead, incorporating multiple orders of effect of decisions made as a planner and an operator. There is no more important or complex part of the world than CENTCOM with this multitude of conflicts, proxies, alliances, and adversaries. Also so full of opportunities presented by our close allies and partners, many represented here. General McKenzie oversees the seas, the land, and airspace for this entire region of the world, where we can say without irony, there is never a dull moment. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to turn your attention to the screen, uh, to my boss, uh, General Ken McKenzie. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I wish I could be there in person for this change of command ceremony, but for the first time in several months, I can say that my virtual presence is not due to the new normal of COVID, but rather the competing demands of a combatant commander. That said, we've gotten pretty good at doing things like this. And given how much time I've spent and will continue to spend with Jim and Pappy, I don't think we're gonna miss a beat here today. Chaplain, as always, thanks for starting things off right with a great invocation. And my thanks to everyone at NAVCENT who orchestrated this event today. My eyes forward tells me everybody looks sharp. I also want to thank the family, friends, distinguished visitors, our coalition partners, and especially the men and women of NAVCENT who are here this morning, either in person or attending virtually. A change of command is a significant moment in history, and I'm glad you're all here to share that moment with us. I also want to thank Charge the Affairs Maggie Nardi and our U.S. Embassy partners for everything they do to support NAVCENT and their families. A special acknowledgement and thanks to our gracious hosts, the Kingdom of Bahrain, for the continued partnership, support, hospitality, and friendship. It's greatly appreciated. The men and women of the Fifth Fleet are honored by this relationship. Two years ago, when Jim Malloy took command of NAVCENT, he did so with a heavy heart after the untimely death of Scott Sterney. It was a tough job, made tougher by the demands of the CENTCOM area of responsibility. NAVCENT was supporting our fight against a very determined ISIS threat in Syria and Iraq, as well as our partners in Afghanistan, who are fighting a defensive battle against the Taliban and ISIS-K. Fast forward to today, and ISIS has been territorially defeated in Iraq and Syria. 
In Afghanistan, we have our best chance in 20 years at a peaceful resolution between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan. This progress could not have happened without top to bottom professionalism and dedication of the Fifth Fleet and your leadership, Jim. To be sure, there's more work to be done in both of these campaigns, but there's cause for optimism. What Jim didn't expect two years ago was the rising threat against the U.S. and our partners, and for that matter, the rest of the world that depends on the free and open navigation of the sea from the Iranian regime. The seizure and sabotage last year of international maritime vessels in the Arabian Gulf by the Iranian regime altered the calculus under which we operated. As if managing naval and air support for named combat operations wasn't enough, Jim Malloy and the NAVSENT team now undertook another mission to deter the Iranian regime from continuing these malign activities, to support freedom of navigation in these vital waterways, and if necessary, to defend U.S. interests on the high seas. Jim took on this mission with relish. Under his command, the Fifth Fleet demonstrated an exceptional ability to respond to operational threats and reestablished it as a true fighting fleet, prepared for major combat operations on short notice, ready to fight a state-owned state war if required. And while I certainly hope we don't have to, I'm completely confident in the posture and resilience of our naval forces and our ability to generate combat power whenever and wherever it is needed. Jim has strengthened the enduring partnership we have with the nation of Bahrain and served as a driving force that sustained multiple maritime coalitions that are vital to achieving CENTCOM lines of effort as well as those of our partners. Because Jim knows that while it's one thing to know how to fight, it's always better if you're not in the fight alone. And the enduring strategic partnerships he has built and sustained with our regional maritime nations have led to the expansion of our combined maritime force the stand up of the International Maritime Security Construct, and the creation of a maritime campaign plan earlier this year. And so I don't think it's by accident that under Jim's watch this year, maritime shipping in the Arabian Gulf and Strait of Hormuz and the global energy supply that courses through this region has largely continued unharassed by malign actors. Jim's actions and the actions of the Fifth Fleet speak for themselves. In the same vein as one of Jim's early mentors, Vice Admiral Doug Katz, who commanded U.S. NAV sent when Jim was his aide, Jim epitomizes the very definition of what a modern, senior, three-star fighting commander should look like. He knows what, what right looks like, and he knows how to turn that vision into reality without fail. He, that he would excel at every mission I gave him was no surprise. I worked with him when I was the Marsent commander, and again when I was the director of the Joint Staff. He was a known quantity to me and a proven winner. And let me tell you, as the director of the Joint Staff, I knew every joint general and flag rank officer and everything about them because I managed that population for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. When it comes time to selecting fighting commanders, it is an exquisitely small, competitive, and talented group from which we choose. But not everyone can command at this level, and not everyone should. There are elements of sophistication and higher order thought that are required of these positions. A lot of officers go into the top of the funnel. Only a few come out at the end. That's by design. It's a privilege to command, not a right. It takes a special mix of experience, maturity, discipline, and courage to lead successfully at these higher levels of command. So I wanna share a few data points that should put things in perspective. Jim graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1986 with just over a thousand other highly intelligent and well-prepared officers. They in turn joined another 4,000 new Navy ensigns who were also joining the fleet that year. And while 5,000 might not seem like a large number compared to the hundreds of thousands in the total force, when your cohort is competing for the same tough jobs and tough commands on notoriously small ships, it's an extraordinarily competitive funnel that you have to work through. So what does it say about Jim? Just one guy out of his graduating class of 1,015, just one guy out of nearly 5,000 commission that he earned the right to command NAV sent one of only a handful of three-star commands in the Navy, and the only one supporting and conducting combat operations across multiple campaigns. It says a lot. It says how hard he worked to earn command of NAVSENT in the Fifth Fleet, commanding at every level in the Navy along the way, to include the Eisenhower Carrier Strike Group, as well as performing magnificently in vital staff functions at some of the highest levels of the Department of the Navy and the Department of Defense. In his leadership over the past two years at NAVSENT, validated the wisdom of the Navy to select him for this command. Jim, you have answered every call, faced every challenge, and achieved every mission I've given you. 
You are a great teammate and brother in arms to your fellow component commanders and to our coalition partners, as well as representatives from across the interagency. Everyone respects and appreciates the strength, leadership, and team player mentality you've provided. They and I respect and appreciate your professionalism, positivity, and infectious personality. And actually, Jim, I'm not talking about COVID when I say that. Jim, thanks for everything you've done for this command. And a personal thanks from myself and Marilyn for the friendship you and Kim have given us and for the dedicated work Kim has done and continues to do on behalf of military families across our area of responsibilities. No good deed ever goes unpunished. So it's not farewell of the Malloy family for me, as Jim will be returning to Tampa to serve as my deputy commander shortly. We're all excited to have you and Kim back home, almost as much as your boys John, Thomas, and James are. I want to mark the close of your command with a quote from Alexander Dumas' epic novel, The Three Musketeers. You should be satisfied with the way you have conducted yourself, with no remorse for the past, confident regarding the present, and full of hope for the future. And when you are tired of bed, you have earned the sleep of the brave. As we say farewell to the outgoing commander, we bid welcome to the new. Sam Papera graduated from Villanova University's Naval ROTC program in 1987 and made his own journey through the Navy selection phone. Along the way, he's managed to amass an eclectic, if not downright impressive, resume of naval and shore assignments, as well as being a Top Gun pilot. Just ask him and he'll be sure to tell you about it. Like Jim Malloy, Pappy is a known quantity to me. He recently served as my J3 on the CENTCOM staff. Pappy, your promotion and selection for this command is a tangible demonstration of the faith and confidence the Navy and I have in you to lead the Fifth Fleet going forward in what continues to be a dynamic and challenging environment. You're inheriting a high-functioning command that's running on all cylinders, and I know you will continue the tradition of excellence this command and the Fifth Fleet have achieved. Your journey here has been a purposeful one. You earned this command, and I look forward to continuing to serve with you, and I know you and Maureen are going to do great work out here. Now let's get moving. There's work to be done. Charge A, Affairs, Maggie Nardi, U.S. Embassy, Bahrain, will now present Vice Admiral Malloy with an end of two award. Will the guests please rise? <laughs> Military members, attention to award. The President of the United States takes pleasure in presenting the Distinguished Service Medal to Vice Admiral James J. Malloy, United States Navy, for service as set forth in the following. For exceptionally Merit meritorious service to the United States in duties of great responsibility while serving concurrently as Commander U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, Commander U.S. Fifth Fleet, and Commander Combined Maritime Forces from December 2018 through August 2020. Vice Admiral Malloy's leadership strengthened international partnerships and expanded maritime security operations to enable free flow of commerce through some of the world's most important strategic maritime choke points. He developed the international maritime security construct to counter Iranian aggression in the Strait of Hormuz and guided its transition to member nation leadership. His focus on combat readiness dramatically improved the lethality of maritime forces in the region, and his forward-thinking integration of maritime forces and non-kinetic capabilities with the other joint forces in the region enhanced the preparedness of U.S. Central Command to meet any contingency. By his superior leadership, wise judgment, and deep devotion to duty, Vice Admiral Malloy reflected great credit upon himself and upheld the highest traditions of the United States Naval Service. For the President, Kenneth J. Braithwaite, Secretary of the Navy. <laughs> Would the guests please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral James J. Malone. Thank you, sorry, appreciate that very much. And again, thank you all for being here today, whether you're online or whether you're in person. We're all adjusting to the new ways to communicate, and I hope that our online guests feel as included and central as if you're physically in the same room. General Mark McKenzie's remarks have humbled me. I have worked for him before. 
washed over him, blazing trails and leading by example, and I'm grateful for his words and his participation today. I have to admit that it is a bittersweet moment for me. I've spent almost 15 of my 34 years in Navy here in this region. Many of you know that I cherish my deep personal and professional connections with the Kingdom of Bahrain, and specifically the Bahrain Defense Force and our formidable Navy and Coast Guard. This is very much my home away from home. Bahrain is an exceptional, gracious, and generous host to the nation to our forces. The relationship between the U.S. Navy and Bahrain is long-standing, strong, and unshakable. The presence of the U.S. Fifth Fleet here remains the cornerstone of our military relationship is a direct reflection of our steadfast and unwavering commitment to ever-strengthening partnerships that ensure regional security and stability. I have made deep and lasting connections in this country, indeed throughout this region, that have sustained me for decades and will be with me for my entire life. On my first tour here in 1992, a young lieutenant, a few sea tours under my belt, really salty, but ready for new challenges, now sent and Bahrain did not disappoint. I was here, it was here that I cut my teeth as, as an aide to my hero, Vice Admiral Cub Katz, on his fleet staff. Fast forward eight years, I was here shortly after 9-11 and saw the initial stirring of what would evolve from the Friendly Forces Coordination Cell into CMF, Combined Maritime Forces, under the steady hand of Rear Admiral James Rennell Nugent and Vice Admiral Tim Keating. So you can imagine my connection to pride in CMF, having seen it grow and, grow and flourish for nearly two decades, and then return almost 10 years later to assume command of CTG 152.1 in Kuwait, the UAE, and then here in Bahrain, all while commanding Destroyer Squadron 50, America's Desert. The Kingdom of Bahrain has also been a touch point and launching pad for me. Each time I've returned, I've had a new role, sometimes concurrently. Over my four tours here, I've made lifelong friends, Bahraini, Saudi, Qatari, Emirati, Omani, Kuwaiti, French, Pakistan, British, and many, many more from countless other nations. Starting with Admiral Katz and his successor, Admiral Scott Red, I have found mentors and learned lessons of leadership that guide me to this day. The deep and rich heritage of the Arab and Islamic world resonates as I wake each morning to the sound of the call to prayer. And remember how fortunate I am to work in this region and live on this island with these people. For the United States Navy and the Joint Force, the work of the NAVSEN team matters and is reinforced out at sea, on the ground, in the air, every single day. This fleet and my fellow component commanders, led by General McKenzie, operate at the center of U.S. national security priorities. On any given day, alongside our partners, our naval forces are operating with, with those partners, promoting maritime security and providing reassurance to the critical shipping industry, protecting key trade routes through which 20% of the world's commerce passes daily, stopping illicit trafficking in drugs and charcoal from funding terrorist organizations, providing rapid response and support of man-made and natural disasters, projecting combat power from the sea in support of operations in Herod Resolve and Freedom Sentinel. We are also executing bilateral and multilateral exercises to increase coordination and interoperability and partnering with other nations to build capacity for future operations as increasingly capable regional maritime forces assume their rightful and well-earned leadership roles from their operation centers and from their ships at sea. The four pillars underpinning all of our success have been common interests, commitment to for the rule of law, collaborative endeavors, and professionalism. A great contrast to those in this region who coerce, who intimidate, who obfuscate, and who would drag this region into a disastrous conflict for their own ends. I think everyone here understands the importance of our fleet, both as an anchor and as a lighthouse in this troubled and, and threatened region. And that common theme hasn't changed since I first arrived here in the region in 1992. Nor has the mandate to build bridges and work together wherever possible. We gratefully embrace this role. Our partnerships have proven their strength time and time again across the years, especially this last two. CMF's 33 member nation, soon to be 34, stay tuned, expanded patrols in, in the region and manned their battle watches with ever-increasing effectiveness to, and reach to deter and interdict illegal activity perpetrated by non-state actors who roam the maritime, abusing the freedoms so universally recognized by engaging in piracy, drug or gun smuggling, harassing or fast roping on the high seas. More on CMF in a moment. But these well-established partnerships also prove decisive 
when state-sponsored attacks plagued the region. In May 9, 2019, four ships anchored in the outer harbor of Fujairah were mined clandestine by clandestine Iranian divers violating the territorial waters of a neighbor. Then in June and July, a number of events followed. The attack by Iranian maritime forces on two ships sailing in the Gulf of Oman, the Front Altair and the Kokoko Courageous, the shooting down of unmanned aircraft flying in international waters, the attempted seizure of the British heritage in the Central Arabian Gulf, followed by the seizure of the British flag Sena and Pira and the Liberian ship Mezgar. It was clear from this escalating trail of violence that an international solution to this globally impacting problem was urgently needed. And we leaned on trusted friends, coalesced around, coalesced around a common threat, and stood up International Maritime Security Construct, Task Force Sentinel. While threat-based, it does not threaten, but instead raises a coalition flag, depicting a shield and not a sword, and patrols the waterways in concert with like-minded and globally responsible partner nations. Sentinel answers offensive threat with deterrence of a unified and robust defensive posture. It answers provocation with de-escalation. It responds to cowardly acts perpetrated in darkness with the bright spotlight of attribution. And finally, it answers coercion and intimidation with the collaborative strength and legitimacy of international law. In other words, Sentinel fulfills a much needed role as relevant today as it was last summer. Its watchwords of vigilance, surveillance, and assurance tell you exactly what Sentinel and that shield is all about and why eight member coalition, the eight member coalition partnered so tightly with the maritime industry plays such a key role in this region today. But as I said, the strength of partnership did not begin with Sentinel. Rather, it was built on a bedrock of shared experiences, common interests, and interoperability. I'm talking about the enduring and expanding coalition construct I spoke of earlier and of which I'm most proud called CMF. Patrolling the Arabian Gulf, North of the Arabian Sea, and the Gulf Bay today and every day, led across three task forces, each commanded more often than not by regional partners, as represented here by task force commanders from Saudi Arabia, from Turkey, and from Jordan. As relevant today as it was 18 years ago, CMF continues to stand as a shining example of an inclusive and an enduring coalition of the willing who come as you are and do as you can, energized and empowered by our internationally recognized mandate, formed around and dedicated to the ideals of promoting and defending maritime security, and protecting and allowing for legitimate trade and commerce. As we say in CMF, we're ready together. We are significantly stronger when we leave politics on the shore, combine our strengths, and sail together. And none of it gets done without our sailors or families who support them, both here and around the globe. And I would like to call out the incredibly selfless dedication you bring to this, this job and this mission every day. It is humbling and it's invigorating. The NAVSEN and broader CMF and the IMSC families go through a lot together. Our work is vital and urgent and can be time consuming as the adversary often gets a vote on the timing. There can be long days, weeks, months, difficult decisions, and frequent lessons in multitasking and trying to balance competing priorities. This year in particular, I stand in rapt admiration of how you have carried out our mission, met tasking, and exceeded all expectations, all while implementing procedures designed to maintain operations while preventing the spread of COVID-19. As always, you flexed, adopted, and persevered. I am honored to serve with such an innovative, determined, and proven group of warriors and such dedicated patriots for their nations. From our most junior sailor on deployment to the four superb leaders who sit on stage with me today, and provide wise counsel to me every day. You are my Navy family, and you are irreplaceable. The United States, a coalition partner, I value, respect, and thank you for what you do. You are precisely why I joined this Navy back in 1986, and serving with you reminds me daily of our common clarion call, as clear now as it ever was, to proudly serve our respective country's Navy combat team with honor, courage, and commitment. Thank you for setting that example and pace every day. Earlier I described why I consider Bahrain my home away from home. There is one special reason it impacted my life more than anything else. And I have said, and her name is Kim. And that's for laughing with me in the picture in the program. On my first tour in Bahrain as a lieutenant on a little island called Nabi Salah, I met the woman who became my best friend, my strongest ally, and my one love. To my great surprise and luck, 
she married me. Our chaplain here from Bahrain performed the ceremony. Kim has enabled and escorted me to do everything that the Navy has asked, all while traveling the world and raising our three wonderful sons, adventurers like their mom and dreamers of the day like their dad. Whether she was supporting a CENTCOM job over her dream to go to Europe, coming home out to the booking the Pentagon after 9-11 to find her folding and packing my desert candies, or most recently coming back from the mall on that dark December day in 2018 to send me on my way with five hours notice to take this job. She has always understood the call to duty that will always bring me back to the Desert Navy and to these people, these incredible people. Most of my friends say that I married up, and I say the top of the Burj Khalifa is about the right distance. I would give anything to end this Middle East adventure as it began, to reluctantly walk away from this great job and these wonderful people for the last time, with Kim holding my hand, as she once took it for the first time when we walked down Exhibition Avenue toward a standard grill, still our favorite place. Thanks for everything, Kim, especially getting up at 3 a.m. to hear your crafty husband drone on. I think she's still waiting. So let's summarize my situation then. I'm about to leave a place I call home, a culture I respect and the people that I know. I'm supported, amazed, and buoyed by, daily by a headquarters staff that knows no people in our Navy in terms of professionalism, energy, productivity, and RPM. I am riding a jet stream on the coattails of combat hardened and formidable task force commanders, most seated here with us. I'm surrounded by the best coalition partners any fleet commander could ever hope for, both in CMF and Sentinel. And I'm privileged to lead these missions with the likes of the incredible, capable general and flag officers seated up, seated up here with me. To add to my personal stress today, my current and my future boss is not here. COVID still challenges us, preventing me from saying farewell in person to dear friends and capable counterparts from Egypt to Pakistan. And my, my kin is not here. In short, Nothing about this ceremony, nothing about leaving today feels good or seems right to me. Nothing. Nothing except one. The man on the computer screen. Let me direct you to NASA's bright future. The sole reason I will be able to leave my beloved NASA in Bahrain with absolute conviction of a soaring future is because my closest friend in the Spray Navy, Admiral Sam Papara, will be my relief. Arguably the Navy's best fighter pilot and strategist, I have seen firsthand his abilities as an operator and warfighter at every level. Most recently as a CENTCOM J3 as he, and as he relieved me in command of USS Eisenhower, strike group. Happy, as he is known, is a universally respected officer amongst admirals and generals in our military. His expertise as a leader is bolstered by a complete mastery of regional challenges and in-depth knowledge of the potential adversary that looms ominously just over the horizon. We've worked so hard here and so successfully since last June to fundamentally change course, to sharpen the sword and turn Fifth Fleet into the fighting fleet that General McKenzie spoke of, now only requiring a franchise quarterback to lead them. With today's exchange of the salutes, that evolution will be complete. Happy if you can hear me, can't see you. This is the second time I have completed a precious and relevant team in your incredibly capable hands. You have an abundance of strength of heart and character to face the challenges ahead, and courage to lead this VIP team with integrity and with honor, in company with the best regional and world partners represented as we look around this room. And on this journey you are embarking on, I know you're not alone, although after 11 days in Rom, you probably wish you were alone. Seriously, your dear wife Maureen, daughter, and sons have joined you on this, the best part of your Navy journey. I am so glad that they are here to share this experience and the incredible air of hospitality with you, continuing to be a source of strength, support, and inspiration to you. As the warmth of the Bahraini people is unmatched in the world, I'm sure you and your children will develop that special affection for Bahrain that every American blessed to live here has. So I will say farewell to this command, farewell to you. I can honestly say I've loved each iteration of the NASA staff I've worked on, but mostly this one. People who care just a little bit more, work just a little bit harder, sometimes play just a little bit harder, but rise and come together to, with, with great effect when adversity or threats emerged. We saw that so clearly in December 2018 when tragedy struck us, and we bid a sad farewell far too soon to a great man and another, another personal hero of mine, Vice Admiral Scott Stern, whose shoes I have feebly endeavored to fill over these last two years, and whose memory of service I will salute every day I wear this uniform. 
I also say farewell to our coalition brothers and sisters, those that sit with us here and those they represent who have served and then returned home, proud of their service and sacrifice, as proud as I am. Those who leave their homes and sail with us in defense of maritime commons against all enemies of freedom, I say farewell to our regional partners, the solid center of the GCC, and anchored by our stalwart bookend partner navies of Egypt, Jordan, and Lebanon to the west, and Pakistan to the east. To Haisam Dinawi watching online and the proud Lebanese Navy, we pray for you in the city of Beirut and promise our continued assistance in any way possible. Finally, I say farewell to Bahrain, represented by my brothers in the front row. I always, always know that you have, that this place, these people, and that you will be in my thoughts and prayers and be ready forever in the heart of this desert sailor. I thank you all for coming today. I will now read my orders. The guests please rise. Those are members, attention to orders. CNO Order 2050. When directed by reporting senior, detached from duty as commander, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, U.S. Fifth Fleet, and commander, Combined Maritime Forces, report for duty as deputy commander, U.S. Central Command. Vice Admiral Papao will now read his orders. I will now read my orders. CNO Order 1120. When directed by the reporting scene, detached from U.S. Central Command, and report for duty as Commander, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, U.S. Fifth Fleet, Commander, Combined Maritime Forces. Admiral Papar, I'm ready to relieve. I'm ready to be relieved. Admiral Malloy, I relieve you, sir. I stand relieved. Ladies and gentlemen, Vice Admiral Navarro, Commander, United States Naval Forces Central Command, Fifth Fleet Combined Maritime Forces. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon to all. I'm honored to assume this duty. I'm humble in the face of its very great challenges. Grateful to be a teammate to our partners and our joint service teammates, and uh, ecstatic to be joined. From my last duty as CENTCOM Director of Operations, I feel I've been a member of this team all along, but I am grateful to return to my maritime rules. For prompt and sustained combat, visit to operations and see. I want to thank Jim Malloy. I want to thank Jim for handing off this great team and more importantly for being such a great mentor and such a very dear friend and brother. Jim's watchwords will always be a keen and intense intellect, a heart of a lion with tremendous affection and loyalty to the seamen, and a relentless work ethic dedication to our country and our partners and our shared missions. Perfect for General Hansen has a certain symmetry also. Uh, war, General McKenzie says, is a contest of wills and uh, indeed a contest of influence. And it's a great honor to continue to serve under General McKenzie's command and uh, I, I look forward to serving in a service department role 
for skin or animal life to look for. Our mentors provided my mentors and my predecessors for special thanks. Admiral Bill Gordon, Admiral Chris Aguilino, Admiral Phil Davidson, and Admiral John Richardson. A special thanks goes to my mentor, friend, and wingman, uh, Admiral Andy Lewis, as well as our predecessors, Admiral Tim Keeney, Admiral David Nichols, Admiral Mark Fox, Admiral Bobby Miller, Admiral Kevin Donegan, and of course Admiral Scott Stern. And I must also thank among the many CEOs who have a teammates who have been foundational in my training, uh, John Snyder, Dave Stewart, Gary Mays, and Nancy Mills. For the team, I have the deepest respect for the mission as laid out by Jennifer Kennedy. I have the deepest appreciation for the indispensable partners and joint service teammates who are teammates in this mission. I have a uh, tremendous amount of humility for the complexity and the challenges ahead, an appreciation for this region that is so vital to the world as an origin of faith, civilization, science, culture, and indeed, being at the geographic crossroads of the world. The mission itself, our mission, is so important. As General McKenzie has stated, we have a mission, so let's move out, and my very great thanks to all of this gentlemen. Thank you. Bosun, host the side boys. Aye, aye, sir. Will the guests please rise and remain standing for the departure of the official party? Vice Admiral, United States Navy, the party. Command, 5th Fleet, Combined Maritime Forces, Departing. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes the United, United, U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, Change of Command Ceremony.